Good afternoon, church. We on here? How's everyone doing? <laughs> Amen. Uh, happy Sabbath to each and every one of you, and uh, happy Labor Day. Happy Labor Day weekend. Um, I've been asked to come before you on behalf of our pastor. Uh, initially, both of our pastors had to go to a health conference uh, this weekend, but it ended up being canceled. And so Pastor Charles took an opportunity to go and visit at another church. And Pastor Powell, who we've been blessed with, an associate pastor, amen, amen. Is, uh, is back at uh, my old church, uh, my old home church, Emmanuel Seventh-day Adventist Church at 1111 Boone Street. And he is there promoting AY, which will be here tonight. Amen? amen. I should hear a hearty amen on that. We haven't had AY in this church in a while. Amen? amen. So it, it's, it's a blessing that we're having AY here. It's a blessing that we're getting started. And Pastor Powell has just been a blessing to this church. Uh, and we thank him. So um, we're going to get right into the message. If you would please bow your heads with me uh, for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for being a God who knows how to lead his people, being an omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for each and every person under my voice, Lord. Thank you for keeping us and sustaining us. We thank you for your grace, Lord, for giving us another day to get it right and for another Sabbath day's rest. Heavenly Father, I ask that you strengthen me. Strengthen me now, Lord, that it be nothing of self, but only you that is heard here this afternoon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The message that I bring to you is not so much a sermon, but it's more of an appeal. It is more of an appeal, and it's been something that's been close to my heart for quite some time. Uh, Getting down to the message, uh, it, it, is, it is exclusive just a little bit, but not fully. And I pray that I don't offend because that's not my intention, but this is something that has been heavy on my heart. And keeping with the theme of Labor Day, are we laboring for the Lord? Are we laboring for the Lord? I pray that we are, and I pray that all of us came in here today with the testimony of our labors just this week for the Lord. Amen? Amen? Are we laboring for the Lord? Thinking back when the Lord brought me into this fold, amen, it was, it was many people who were labored for the Lord to get me here. It was my mother's prayers and my mother's laboring for the Lord that brought me out of the state that I was in and brought the word of God to me when my disobedience and hard-headedness would not allow me to walk into the house of God. Amen. But it was her laboring for the Lord is the reason why I'm here. And it's the Holy Spirit using a lot of you and a Holy Spirit using man to labor for the Lord, which is the reason why a lot of you, including myself, are here today. Amen. Amen. Are we laboring for the Lord? So this Labor Day, we're not going to contemplate on anything carnal. We're going to contemplate on the people that are laboring for the Lord. Amen? Amen? Are we doing a spiritual work? Because we have a lot of people out there that are doing a spiritual work. So we're going we're gonna to contemplate and we're going to honor those that, that, that are out there in our overseas uh, missionaries. We honor our missionaries here on our homeland. We honor our call porters. We honor our health ministry evangelists, our ADRA, humanitarian aid workers, our Seventh-day Adventist professors, and our school teachers, and the people that open up their homes for Bible studies. Because we need to be edifying each other, amen? amen? Building each other up, and we should honor each other in the Lord, amen? Because we have a work to do, and we're going home, brothers and sisters. Do you believe that? Amen. This is not our home. Amen. This is not our home. So we need to wrap up our work here so that we can get home. Are we doing the work of the Lord? 
Just coming into the church myself, though, well, not just coming, I've been in the church a while, but thinking back on the ones that, that, that have labored with me, it's been, it's been such a blessing to, to, to come across the people that have labored for the Lord because it takes a community of believers to retain a Christian. I firmly believe that. It takes a community of believers to retain a Christian. It takes a community of you to retain a Christian. When you see a new person walk into this door, did you go and greet them? How you doing, brother? Praise the Lord, good to see you. What's your name? When we see a new face walk into this door, we should be wrapping our arms around that brother, wrapping our arms around that sister immediately because it takes a community of Christians to retain a Christian and it took a, a community to retain me. I remember when I first came in the church and me and my family, we were in and out and in and out and I would come one week and, and we'd miss the next week and I'd, I'd come the next week and we'd miss two weeks and, and, and finally a, a, a brother pulled me aside. He was a short elderly gentleman, about 80 years old and he says, look here brother, come here. Some of y'all might know brother Duncan. Hey, come here. I mean this brother's got, you know, he, I see you in and out here and hey look man, you got to be here. And he said it with such conviction, you got to be here. And I says, well, you know, I, 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 I try and I have my four kids and we're trying to get, he says, man, look, I got 12 kids. <laughs> How do you make an excuse to that? <laughs> I have 12 kids. You get here. I don't care if you come here and you have one shoe on, one shoe off, one sock on, one sock off. This is where your blessing is. You have to be here. And he said that with such conviction to me that I started coming to church every week. Amen. It was a community of Christians that looked out and they saw me and they saw this Christian and they saw me struggling. They said, hey man, come here. They pulled me aside. I remember an elder that worked with me and my family doing Bible studies. Amen. And he would come and we would do Bible studies and I had so many questions and he was trying to keep with the rules of Bible study. You know, we have rules and it's just an hour, brother, and I, and I don't want to overstay. No, brother, but I need to ask you. And sometimes we go two hours and his wife would end up calling, where are you at, you know? <laughs> and he'd be so apologetic, you know, I'm so sorry, I'm so, what are you sorry for, you know? I should, it should have just been an hour, amen? But this brother had so many books and I was asking about his books and I'm asking about this and I'm asking that and he's, you just focus on the Bible. You focus on this Bible. And the brother continually to keep me focused on that Bible. Amen? Amen. That when we got baptized, and I finally got baptized and, and, and as a family, and then I, I kept asking questions, and he finally said, here, let me, let me tell you something. Go and get this. And he referred me to a book. It was Pathway to the Throne of God by a lady named Sarah Peck. I don't know if you know. And, and, Le and, and from The Coming of the Comforter. It's a book on the Holy Spirit. And he says, you go get those two books. You get those books in you, you'll be on your way to being a well-rounded Christian. And I praise the Lord for that, because I read both of those books, and it did push the fast-forward button on my walk. A community, a community of Christians to retain one Christian. That's what we're talking about. Are we laboring for the Lord? That's what we're talking about. I praise the Lord for the laborers that helped retain me and helped strengthen me. When it was the end, when the Lord had, 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 had brought me as far as I can come, I remember coming to this church until the day I don't even know how I found this church, to be honest with you. But I remember sitting in that back pew on that side. And I remember these elders, because we're watching. Christians, these newcomers, they're watching you. I watch the elders here. I watched Junior Borg, I watched Terry McQueen, I watched Tom Bell, I watched these brothers. And these brothers are firm in the Lord, amen? amen? They stood for principle and that's what struck me here. Immediately I sat back here thinking these are men of principle. These guys aren't afraid to stand for what they believe in. I'm coming back. And I couldn't even get out the door that day because a, a, a vacation Bible school was going and the ladies were, oh, look at all these kids coming to vacation. God, I says, wow, they're serious about vacation Bible school here. <laughs> and they just, they, they wrapped around us here. We're talking about laboring for the Lord. But as I think about the laborers for the Lord, I'm starting to see it, a disappointing similarity. I saw one at the last church and it is alive and well here in this church. 
and it's a bit disappointing to me. Where is my generation? Where are the young adults? I'm talking 45, 40, 35, 30, 25, 20. You're outnumbered in the labor of the Lord. When I'm looking at this church and I'm getting with our brothers and we have things going on, when I look out front, I'm seeing the elders of our church out there, but I'm not seeing too many young brothers, young sisters. Where is my generation? Where are the young people in this work? We're talking about laboring for the Lord. Early Sabbath service, 9.15 to 9.30. I don't see many young people here. Where is my generation? Where are the young adults? Most of us have jobs, I understand that. Most of us jobs start at seven o'clock in the morning, five o'clock in the morning, amen? Eight o'clock in the morning. Early morning Sabbath school starts at 9.15. That's sleeping in, isn't it? Where's my generation? Where are the young people? If we're not here, if we're not coming through that door with fervor, ready to serve the Lord, it, 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 it kind of gets me to think that or wonder, are we keeping the Sabbath correctly? Are we protecting the borders of the Sabbath? We're a fast-moving generation. We're a technological generation, able to reach all the way across the world from the comfort of your living room. Are you laboring for the Lord? God has given me a message. This is Testimonies to the Church, Volume 7, page 9. Sister says, God has given me a message for his people. They must awake, spread their tents, enlarge their borders. My brethren and sisters, you have been bought with a price. And all that you have and are is to be used to the glory of God. Does all mean all? Does it mean some? Does it mean a little? Does all mean all? All that you have, all that we have, are to be used to the glory of God and the good of your fellow man. Christ died on the cross to save the world from perishing in sin. He asked your cooperation in this work. Did he say he's going to do it by himself without you? No. Did he say he's going to do it by himself without you? No. He's asking for our cooperation in this work. You are to be his helping hand. With earnest, unwavering effort, you are to seek to save the lost. Remember that it was your sins that made the cross necessary. Was it, was it Jesus' sin that made that cross necessary? Was it ours? Were we the ones that sinned? So I can say, well, I wasn't there at the time. I wasn't in the crowd screaming, crucify him, crucify him. How, how is it me that, that did it? Are you sinless now? So then it was your sins, and it still is our sins that makes the cross necessary. When you accept Christ as your Savior, you pledge yourself to unite with him and bearing the cross for life and for death. You are bound up with him, a part of the great plan of redemption. Amen. Amen. Look at the words, bound with him. We're doing this together. He's not doing it for you. Amen. The transforming power of Christ's grace molds who does it mold? The one who gives himself to God's service. If I don't give myself to God's service, is his transforming grace going to mold me? 
imbued with the spirit of the Redeemer, he is ready to deny self, ready to take up the cross, ready to make any sacrifice for the master, any sacrifice for the master. No longer can he be indifferent to the souls perishing around him. No longer can he see a brother and sister over here waddling in sin and not saying nothing. No longer can he see a brother and sister suffering and not go over and lend a hand. No longer can he see his brother and sister thirsty and not give him a drink. No longer can he see his brother and sister hungry and not do everything in his power to bring them something to eat. No longer, he cannot be indifferent to the souls perishing around him. He is lifted above self-serving. He has been created anew in Christ and self-serving has no place in his life. He realizes that every part of his being belongs to Christ who has redeemed him from the slavery of sin that every moment of his future has been bought with a precious lifeblood of God's only begotten son. You have been bought with a price. We have a job to do. And that goes for everyone in here. But when it comes to my generation, when it comes to the young adults, from what I'm seeing, I am seeing a lack of duty. There's a lack of duty there, I'm sorry. And I don't mean to step on toes. Duty is not wanting to have to do something but going and doing it anyways. Duty is a soldier ready for battle, not wanting to go, not in his throat, not in his stomach, cringing, hearing about the horrible deaths that are going on out there, but saying that I will go and going anyway. Duty is looking at another brother and sister perishing and going and saying something. Duty is listening to the Holy Spirit when you know it's the Holy Spirit telling you, bring this pamphlet over to that sister. She needs that right now. And you're wrestling in your mind that you don't want to, do, whether you want to do it or not. But you do it anyways. Duty is putting self aside and going forth and doing what the Lord is asking you to do, whether you want to or not. We make so many excuses. Where's my generation? Where are the young adults? Who will give the last cry? Couple statistics, we're not gonna put a lot of time for them. The harvest is plenty but the laborers are few. How fast did big cities grow last year, 24, uh, 20, 2014 statistics? Austin at the top of the list, 2.9%. Denver, number two. Seattle, number three. Fort Worth, number four, 2.3%. And, and Miami, number five. Top five, two of the cities right here in your state. Fastest growing. The word of the Lord needs to be spread right there, not just on your front. And here we are again. What state contains the top 20 fastest growing U.S. counties? We just saw Texas. This is your backyard. Are we laboring for the Lord? This is your backyard. Fastest growing U.S. cities with populations of more than a million. San Antonio, number one right here in Texas, your backyard. Dallas, number two, right here in Texas, your backyard. Houston, number three, right here in Texas, your backyard. San Antonio, Phoenix, San Diego, New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, and Chicago. Are we laboring for the Lord? So many people walk by this site. So many people. Are we laboring for the Lord? And so much as you have done unto one of them, the least of these, my brethren, you have done unto me. The Lord is not asking you to go to the wealthy. The Lord is not asking you to go to the favorable. 
to the least of these, my brethren. What you have done to the least of these, you have done unto the Lord. Amen? Amen. They will know we are Christians by our what? Love. Amen. Turn with me, if you will, please, to John 6. John chapter 6. We're going to look again, staying with the theme of labor. John chapter 6. And we're going to 24 through 27. But, 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 but let's, uh, I, I want to paint a picture here, but we're going to skim through to paint the picture because uh, we don't have a lot of time. So starting at five to paint the picture, we see here uh, uh, when Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith to Philip, when shall we buy bread? Now here we, we see the story of, uh, it, 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 let me paint the picture, it's Passover, amen? And it, uh, Passover's coming in a couple months. We have a lot of people coming into town. There's over 5,000 people, and they've heard of Jesus, and they're all coming out to see Jesus and to hear him speak. And now they see this great multitude coming, and Jesus looks at Philip, and he tries Philip. Right here in, in, in 6. That's John, chapter 6, verse 6. He, uh, he says, And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. So Jesus asked him in five, Philip, when shall we buy bread and meat for them? But he, Jesus already knew what he would do. So he's asking Philip, he's trying him. Kind of like parents do, we try our kids, right? I got a quarter in my hand and I'm, oh, look, it's gone. And the kids are, oh, wow. Or some of them might be sharp enough to say, you put that in your other hand, daddy. You know? And we liked it, I'm a sharp kid there, amen? And how much more proud would Jesus have been if he asked Philip something like that? Where are we gonna get this food, Philip? Been walking with Jesus all this time and seeing all these miracles and Philip, I don't know, Jesus, I don't know. You know, how much more proud would Jesus have been if Philip was like, stop playing, Jesus, feed these people. <laughs> stop, feed the people, amen? He was testing his faith to see what he knew, to see what, where his faith was, but Philip failed that test. Philip said, ah, I don't know, Lord. He says here, seven, Philip answered to him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them. He's saying 200 days worth of work is not going to be enough money to feed all these people, Jesus. And Jesus looked, hmm. And then so here's Simon Peter, uh, or uh, Simon Peter's brother, uh, Andrew, and he's looking, and he's looking throughout the people. S sounds to me like he's taking a census of, did you bring anything to eat? Did you bring in? Now here you have the Savior, the Creator, the miracle worker, but we're walking away from him trying to figure out how we're going to do this. And finally, Jesus, we're going to cut this short. Because Andrew finally find this boy here. He's got two, uh, five loaves of bread and two fish. Bring it here. Jesus blessed the meal and began to portion it out and fed 5,000 people and had plenty left over. Amen? Amen. So now, skipping down to 15 real fast, uh, 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 you know, d d d uh, because we're running out of time, it says, when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him king, and he departed again into mountain himself alone. So now, here we see the people, after he had done such a miracle, they're like, this has got to be the son of God, you know? Well, we got it. And, and they were planning to take him and make him king. But Jesus didn't come to rule on this world. Amen. He already has this world. But he come to prepare us for, for what he has prepared for us in heaven. Amen. But they were going to, he, he sensed they were going to come and try to take him and make him. So he fled into the mountains. And later on down here, he ends up going to Capernaum. And so we see this, this multitude. They start to follow Jesus. Well, he's gone to Capernaum, and here we pick up in 24 when it says, When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took uh, shipping and came to Capernaum, seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, whence comest thou? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, 
ye seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. You just want another potluck. <laughs> That's what he's saying. You just want another potluck. You had a good meal. You want another one. But he says, labor not for the meat which perished, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him God hath sealed. Amen? Amen. <laughs> labor not for the meat that perisheth. We should be laboring for this meat. Amen? Amen. This is the meat, the eternal meat. This is the bread of life, our sweet manna that the Lord has given us. This is what we should be laboring for, amen? This is what we should have a burden for. That burden, that anointing that the Lord put on us, that anointing is a burden for souls. We should have that burden for souls. Do you have that burden for souls? Are you laboring for the Lord? If we had this manna, if we were studying every day, how much more zeal would we have Sabbath morning if truly we were in, uh, in the Word all week and all week making preparations for the Sabbath that when it finally came, we were set and ready to usher it in? How much more zeal would we have? We should be flying through those front doors at 9.15 with a testimony on your tongue, God in your heart, and evangelism on your mind. How much more zeal would we have? Are we laboring for the Lord? You've been bought with a price. I'm shy. I can't get up there and speak like everyone else. I'm bashful. I'm not a theology major. I'm not a good public speaker. I've never led out before. We come with excuse after excuse after excuse, but to that I say, and I do understand, I do understand, but how blessed are you to have a home church in which to sharpen your skills? Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Believe it or not, and I'm sure you should if you're a member of this church, your church does need your services here. Yes. We would welcome your services here. Yes. There are many things that you can get involved with here in this church. Men's ministry, women's ministry, Sabbath school, VBS, Pathfinders, Adventures, Social Committee, Dorcas, and so many others. How blessed are you to have a home church in which to sharpen your skills? Are you taking advantage of it? Are you laboring for the Lord? Do you truly, truly, truly believe that we are at the edge of eternity? I mean, I know we say it. We say, oh, it's the end of the world, and you know the signs of the times, and there they are, and the Pope has come. You know what that means. Do you really, do you really believe it? Yes. Are you laboring for the Lord? For your faith without works is dead. That's what James said in, in cha James chap chapter 2 uh, verse 17. Your faith without works is dead. If you truly, truly believe we would be doing everything possible to prepare ourselves. A self-sacrificing work. Are we laboring for the Lord? The Lord gives us so many promises that he will be with us. He will go before us. He will be beside us. So many promises the Lord gives us. Some that are in your bulletin, I've taken the opportunity to write some, to, to note some. If you'll turn with me uh, to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 9. Let's just look at a few. 1 
1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. Uh, say amen when you have it. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9 says, For we are laborers together with God. Are we doing this by ourselves? We are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. Amen. Ecclesiastes chapter uh, 4, verse 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9, says, 9 uh, through 11. You'll actually see, it says here, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But, who, but woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? Here we see admonishment. We see that we go out in twos. We know this, right? Through evangelism. Are we alone? We have the Lord on our side and we have his guidance to tell us to go out and choose. But if I'm doing this alone, and I have, and, and I have a, a, a generation or a church that doesn't want to work, I, can, I don't have the luxury of having a second. I don't have the luxury of that backup, amen? Are you laboring for the Lord? Are we laboring for the Lord? Deuteronomy 31.6. Actually, Deuteronomy 24. Deuteronomy 24 says, For the Lord your God is, that goeth, is he that goeth with you to fight against your enemies to save you. Are we doing this alone? So many scriptures, so many scriptures that the Lord tells us he is not leaving us alone. We are not doing this by ourselves. Amen? The Lord is with us. The Lord gives us so many promises that, 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 that he will keep us. And brothers and sisters, I leave you with this. Right back to the beginning where we started. God has given us a message. He has a message for his people that we must wake up. We must spread, we must spread our tents and enlarge our borders. You have been bought with a price and all that you have and are is to be used to the glory of God and for the good of your fellow man. Our excuses simply will not do. Are we laboring for the Lord? If you've made a decision to continue on with the Lord, to labor for the Lord, if you will make a covenant to do all that it is in his good pleasure, if you are willing, please stand with me for a word of prayer. I hope, I, I cannot plead enough the severity of the times that we're living in. The severity of the times that we're living in. We need to be on a, self, a selfless mission. Self-serving has to be completely put away. We need to be laboring for the Lord. Here at Cleburne First, it starts here. This is a strong church. If you're willing to labor for the Lord, you have so much back right here. Are we willing to labor for the Lord? Please bow your heads with me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for seeing each and every person on their feet, Lord. And the ones that couldn't stand, Heavenly Father, we know you see them too. Heavenly Father, I say a special prayer. 
a special prayer for Cleveland First Seventh-day Adventist Church. Heavenly Father, I say a special prayer for your church abroad. That you strengthen your people, Heavenly Father. Send a double dose of your Holy Spirit. And not only that, give us, open up our hearts, Heavenly Father, that we may be ready to receive the Holy Spirit. That we are willing to do the work of the Lord. We ask for your strength, your guidance, and we are always careful to praise your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.